All right. Well, good to see everyone tonight. We are going to continue. I'm going to get right into the message without doing any housekeeping tonight. We're going to be talking tonight in this series that we've been doing about the allegory story. This is number five, actually the number of grace. Last week we did Psalm 23, and one of the things that I shared with you from the Aramaic there is the Aramaic has only two verb tenses, if you recall from last week. It has perfect tense and imperfect tense. The verb tense in Aramaic is perfect tense that is right now, present. And then it has also imperfect tense that is right now, present, but continuing. You know, like when you sow to the Spirit, right now, as you sow to the Spirit, and continue to sow to the Spirit, that continues. What is manifested continues. And one of the things that I really like in the Aramaic is it does not talk about future. It talks about right now. And we found that out last week when we did Psalm 23. It says at the beginning there in the King James, the Lord is my shepherd. But now listen to this. It switches to the present. The Lord is shepherding me. Big difference. Can you hear the difference there? Of course you can. And so that's one of the things we're going to find in the Aramaic. Now, Jesus spoke, his native tongue was Aramaic. I believe he knew Hebrew, but his native tongue was Aramaic, and his parables and everything he taught and the miracles and everything he did when he spoke, it was, he spoke in Aramaic, not Greek. And I've come to find out that some of the Greek was not quite as reliable as we thought. James Strong, in his Strong's Concordance, has some mistakes there. And then the translators enlarged upon that. And of course, we could go back as far as Rome and so forth, where they didn't want us to know certain things. Now, I don't know if it was greed for money or if it was just control or what it was, but they did not want us to know some things. And then the translators took what they changed and changed it even more. It's kind of like the little game telephone, right? Remember one Christmas we did that here at our Christmas party, we did telephone and, and someone said something to the first person and by the time it got to the last person, it was completely different. And you see, that's basically what has happened in the scriptures. So the Greek is not quite, and I've used the Greek a lot, but there were a lot of times when I look up something in Strong's Concordance, I would think, Hmm, that doesn't quite sound right. It seems like there should be a little bit more to that. And I would try, sometimes then I would just go to the dictionary and look up synonyms or antonyms, and then I would bring forth, you know, a, a meaning from the dictionary. And sometimes that makes a whole lot more sense than trying to, you know, get it out of the Greek because the Greek is just not always right. You know, we've heard people say, well, you know, that's Greek to me. Well, there's a lot of things that we're finding out have been Greek to us. So, so what I want to do tonight is get in, you can go if you have your Bibles or devices, to Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to talk about the Lord's Prayer, what was known as the Lord's Prayer. We know the disciples had come to Jesus and said, will you teach us to pray? And so he began to teach them to pray there in Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to see a couple of very notable changes and switches that were made by the translators. So as I begin this, I I want us to first of all see that this prayer that Jesus taught to the disciples is for us. How many know a lot of the things that they said back then, in fact, most of the things they said back in the ancient days or Jesus' days was to them. It wasn't to us. It was to them, but for us. In other words, we can gain some information. We can gain some revelation from it. But as we begin this prayer of Jesus in Aramaic from Matthew chapter 6, the Aramaic word now, this is the Aramaic. The Aramaic word for prayer is slotha, S-L-O-T-H-A. But the minute that we hear that, slotha, and the minute that we realize that that word came from a verb tense, 
SLA or SLA, the minute we hear that, we want to think of our English idea of prayer. So slatha, the word slatha, translated into English, is prayer. And all nouns in Aramaic were built from a root verb. And so the root verb of slatha is sla, or S-L-A, and it means to pray. But again, many times, you know, we can right away think about prayer in the English and what that means. So this word prayer, coming from sla, like to pray, this is what it means. It has several meanings, but I'm going to hone in on just one. To pray in Aramaic means an adjustment. Well, that's not bad, right? To pray also in Aramaic means to lay a snare. It means to incline. It means to turn toward. It means to array, but here's the one I want to use, the last one, to set a trap. Prayer in Aramaic means to trap. And normally, as I said, when we think of prayer, we associate it with talking, yak, yak, yak. To trap. I could say it this way if I wanted to be funny. If someone doesn't understand what to trap means, it means shut yours. <laughs> But that's not really what it means. I'm just using that to try to be a little funny if you don't understand. We think prayer is strictly us talking and usually asking for things. But you see, when Jesus gave this prayer to the disciples, it was to open them up and to shift their energy. So when we see that this word is given to us, for us, to them, but for us, it can be used to open us up and to shift our energy. For example, you can be doing your daily duties on a daily basis, working or whatever you do during the day, and you can be flowing in a certain level of energy, and then all of a sudden you shift into prayer, and what happens is there's an energy shift from what you're seeing with the two eyes on your head and an energy shift from the, what you're hearing with your two ears on your head as well. In other words, there is a shift. Now, in talking about prayer, I'm talking about what true prayer really is tonight. And unless we have that shift, unless we have that shift from seeing what our eyes see as we go into prayer, or hearing what our ears may be hearing, we're not going to have the shift as we could have it. So in other words, what happens in real true prayer is that you get into the state of prayer where you trap your whole being and it shifts. There's a shift that happens. And when your energy shifts in prayer, Everything, yourselves and everything within your whole being is shifting into a new way of understanding and a new way of capturing something. Now I'm going to use an old-fashioned definition. If you have a CD that has a program on it and you put it into a CD player, you're going to get what's on that program. But if you have a CD that has no program on it whatsoever, and you slip it in the CD player, you ain't going to hear nothing. Now, I liken prayer to that. Now, I can remember, and you know, my father, I was raised in a very religious church. It was about for the women, especially the length of your hair and the clothes that you wear. But my, my parents were very religious uh, in, a, in, a, in a good way in one sense. They just didn't know any better. You know, a lot of the churches we've attended, and it's not that they were trying to deceive us purposely. They just didn't know any better. That's what they were taught. But every once in a while, we would always pray before our meals a silent prayer, and we'd also pray a silent prayer after our meals. But every once in a while, maybe once a month or so, my father would take out the Bible when we were finished reading, uh, when we were finished eating, and he would read from the scriptures, maybe a chapter or a, maybe sometimes two, you know, to bore me. But anyhow, he would read a chapter or two from the Bible, and then he'd pray this long prayer. And I kid you not, and he was sincere. 
A lot of people are sincere, but just sincerely wrong. But I kid you not, I could go ahead of him one or two sentences, and I could say exactly what he was going to say. But there's a much deeper aspect of prayer which Jesus was talking about, and it was like this example I gave you, going in with this blank CD, because a blank disc will pick up on what is transmitted. In other words, if you have, you, when you go into prayer, if you go in with, so to speak, a blank disc with not any program, I gotta pray for this, I gotta pray for that, I gotta pray for the other, I have to ask Father for this, I have to ask Father for that, if you go in with a blank disc, as it were, then spirit can raise up within you and can anoint that prayer and cause you to pray by the spirit. You know, Paul himself said, we don't even know how to pray, but many times we think we do because we have the disc with the program on. Yeah. But if we'll go into prayer with a blank disc, no program no asking for anything, no plans whatsoever, no agenda whatsoever, then we have gone in open and receptive. And then everything within us can begin to shift, and that is what will constitute then direct communication with the Father. Now, this prayer in Matthew chapter 6 that we call the Lord's Prayer, is really not the Lord's Prayer, John 17 is the Lord's Prayer, but they call it the Lord's Prayer, and that prayer is sung, it is quoted. People in congregations many times will, will quote it together. It's sung or it's quoted at funerals, even at weddings. But now let me give you a couple of differences in this prayer. First of all, the one major difference in this prayer, and I've shared this with you before, when we talked about the differences between the Aramaic, there's 12,000 differences in the English Bible between the Aramaic and the English Bible. 12,000 differences. And I gave you a few of those. But in this prayer, there's one part of it that says, Lord, lead us not into temptation. Well, guess what? He doesn't lead us into temptation. Right. You can read that in James. It's when you are drawn away of your own lust. And it's conceived, and that can be intellect, reason, logic, senses, emotions. When you don't yield those to the Christ mind, that is known as lust. And therefore, what happens is that you then are tempted. Temptation comes into your life. Now, this is what the Aramaic says of that. In fact, do you know that Benjamin Franklin rewrote the Lord's Prayer? And one of the things that bothered Benjamin Franklin about the Lord's Prayer was this, what I'm saying right now. Lord, lead us not into temptation. And he rewrote the Lord's Prayer, Benjamin Franklin. Now, this is what he said, and this is what the Aramaic says. He was very close to the Aramaic. The Aramaic doesn't say, Lord, lead us into temptation. The Aramaic says, do not let us enter into temptation. How do we not let us enter into temptation? By yielding our mere intellect, being led by our mere intellect, reason, logic, senses, and emotions. Those lusts. See, and when those lusts, it says, James says, when the lusts are conceived within your heart awareness, when they're conceived there and you think of them over and over and over and over, you're leading yourself into temptation. You see. Now, another thing, when we look at this prayer in Matthew 6, have you noticed the word God is nowhere to be found? Why? Simply because he was shifting, Jesus in this prayer was shifting their imagery and their understanding away from a title and even from thinking in terms of masculinity. He was shifting them away from thinking of omnipresence, omniscience, and omnipotence. He was moving their consciousness, he was desiring in this prayer to move their consciousness into another direction. In fact, did you know that Jesus seldom used the term God? So what did he use here in this prayer? He used the word awun. Awun, which is translated our father. And what I'm saying tonight is not going to resonate whatsoever with Western evangelical Christianity. It is not going to resonate with them. It's not going to resonate with religiosity. 
Now, why did he translate this as a wound when he began the prayer, or our father, because he did not want them to think in terms of masculinity, which started way back in the patriarchal system where everything was about men and nothing, women couldn't experience anything for the most part. Culture, culture. So he was wanting them to move away from thinking in terms of our father being a title, God, and masculinity. And so the ancient world, the problem, listen, the problem with biblical studies is that people study it from, they study the Bible from a theological perspective. The word theo simply means God, and ology means the study of God. And he was wanting to move them away from this. Now, who is he talking to? He was talking to farmers and fishermen, people that couldn't read, people that couldn't write. And we spent four to five years in seminary to learn what these guys knew that couldn't read or write. Come on. I right? that. So listen, his teaching to these farmers and fishermen was so powerful in their lives concerning prayer that it turned them inside out. It caused them to have a transformation from the inside to the outside. So when he gave this prayer, he says, when you pray, talking to his disciples, to them for us, say, Our Father. Now, there are several things I want us to note here tonight. First of all, there is a shifting of energy, and our imagination begins to shift when we even use the words, Our Father, a wound. Well, we don't say a wound, but he did. That was Aramaic for Jesus. Our Father. Because you see, we don't see it like the, the way that the Near East or Semitic people saw it. We don't see prayer the way they saw prayer. We don't see our Father the way that they saw our Father. And that's what I want to explain as number one tonight. What is the difference between the way they saw our Father and the way we see our Father? First of all, the term father and the term mother in Aramaic, also in Hebrew, because Hebrew is close to Aramaic, but there's still some mistakes in the Hebrew, but in Aramaic, Arabic, and in Hebrew, when they would say our father, it meant something different than what it means to us today. We just glibly say our father. We don't think too much about it. But it's a very sacred term. And so these three languages connected our father to the word beloved. So when we say our father, now I'm heading somewhere with this. When we say our Father, we are saying beloved, as it says there in verse 9, our Father. Beloved was a term of endearment to the people, the Semitic people of the Near East. For example, do you know that a father would call his son father? A mother would call her daughter mother. Friends would call their friends Either one, mother or daughter, because it was a term of endearment. Just like we call people sweetie, or honey, or dear, or precious, or darling. If we went over there and used those words, they would think, what? <laughs> Just as if we went over there and we heard a father call his son father, we would think, what? But they were terms of endearment to those people. You could even call our father, father, mother. If you called God, father, mother, our father, mother, instead of just our father, you'd still be saying our beloved. So that's the first shift, number one, that we have when we begin this prayer, father, beloved. It causes a, doesn't it cause a shift when you call someone dear or honey? I mean, if a honey calls her husband a honey, or her honey a honey, that could evoke some whoopee. Yeah. See? That could evoke some things. So these are tears. These are, these are words. Excuse me. These are, are endearments. They are words of endearment. 
So what does this do then when we say our Father, knowing that it's not a title we're speaking, even if we say our Father and Mother, what does this do? It shifts something and it causes us to have this shift into delight. And a lot of people don't think of prayer as a delight. It's boring to them. But these words shift us into a realm of delight and a realm of energy when we understand that saying our Father simply means our beloved and it is a term of endearment. A complete shift can take place. We can come into a shift of, as I said, delight, receptivity, receiving, and ecstasy. Now that's the idea of prayer to these Semitic people. That's how they came to understand prayer. And it puts them, and it puts us into another state. So number one, when you say Father, if you understand what you're saying, it shifts the energy sure does. to delight, to receptivity, so to ecstasy. So it's important for us to understand these things, right? Our Father, our Beloved. Now the second thing then, that our beloved shifts and brings us into an understanding of, the minute that you say that, then you come to understand, hey, I'm an heir, H-E-I-R. So that puts us in another position or another shift as heir of the beloved, or an heir of love, or an heir of compassion, an heir of joy, an heir of harmony, an heir of understanding, an heir of enlightenment. And you know what? That is our inheritance. Every one of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5 is our inheritance. We are love. We are joy. We are faith. We are, we are all of those things. And as we recognize that and are consciously aware of that, then we manifest that in our lives. So like the example of this CD here, when we go into prayer, let's go into it with a blank CD, not with a program. I want something. Not with a program, not with an agenda, not with asking, why do we have to ask? I know the word ask is used, but it really means asking for understanding. You can see the word ask in the scripture. But it's talking about, it's simply talking about asking to know and to understand and to realize that we have all things already. The invisible realm, you came here with all things. I came here with all things. We came here as health and wealth and all things of the kingdom. It's who we be. And this is why Mark eleven twenty six 26 says, when you pray, believe that you have not after it manifests. we we'll say that again. That's why it says, when this is the objective, yeah. when you pray, believe. Yes. Not wait till you have it in your hand and then you're going to believe. Like seeing is believing. Yeah. So that's talking about the objective invisibility that we have as our inheritance on the inside of us. And not only is it in us, it's who we are. We are health, we are wealth, we are all things of the kingdom of God. That is our inheritance. Now, in verse 9, it goes on to say of Matthew 6, your name is sacred. In the English, it says, hallowed be thy name. But in the Aramaic, you know, it sounds like hallowed be thy name. In the English, one day, see, future, see. But in the Aramaic, it's, your name is is speaks of now, the isness. Your name is sacred, which means, and what does nature me name mean? It means nature and character. But now listen, we can't stop there because name to the Near East people and in Aramaic meant and means the way. Yep. In one way. The way. In other words, pray the way Jesus prayed, that way. Minister the way Jesus ministered, yes. that way. Yes. From the Aramaic, by showing that it's all present right now. Right. So where it says your name is sacred, it means it's set apart. It's sanctified. 
It's distinct. Now listen. And it's distinct and set apart and sanctified for a purpose. Now, let me couple that with 1 Thessalonians 5.23. First or second, I think it's first. First Thessalonians 5.23. In the classic Amplified, it tells us there that we are sanctified through and through spirit, soul, and body. So that the fact that your name is sacred shows us that our name is sacred. Our character is sacred. Our way needs to be sacred. See, we're set apart. We're distinct. You know, God did put a difference in his people. Come on. We talked about that this morning. God did put a difference between his people. Why? Because they simply participated. So our Father, your name is sacred in Aramaic, means set apart, sanctified, distinct for a purpose. Now, what is the purpose? The purpose is that we would be an expression of all that he said we already are. That was his purpose. So that should be our purpose. One of the things we're going to study in this, in this series as we go into the Aramaic is there is no difference between spirit, soul, and body. And that's what it says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23 in the Classic Amplified. We're sanctified spirit through and through. We're sanctified through and through spirit, soul, and body. So that means my spirit, my soul, and my body are one and sanctified. In the, in the Aramaic, they didn't even put commas when they talked about spirit, soul, and body. Why? It was all one to them. Meaning, as I've said for so many years, my body is just as spirit as my spirit is spirit, objectively, and my soul part or feminine principle is just as spirit as my spirit is spirit. That's cool. In Aramaic, there's no dividing. We're sanctified through and through. Let me say it this way. We're spiritified through and through. I'm just a spirit in my body, objectively, as I am in any other part. We're one in him. So that's what you get out of your name is sacred. It's set apart. It's distinct for a purpose. And what is the purpose? To be an expression of all that we have always been from before the foundation of the world. Now, number three then. In verse 10, the English says, Thy kingdom come, thy kingdom come. But in Aramaic it says, Let the beloved's counsel come. Kingdom is counsel in Aramaic. The word kingdom is malkutha, and it's simply the word counsel, to counsel. So what you're doing now is, because you're in a state of delight, delight, because you're in a state of receptivity, because you are realizing you're an heir, because you're realizing this, what is happening, then you ask and look for, in prayer, the counsel of the kingdom. The counsel of the kingdom. So because you have shifted everything and you're in the state of delight, receptivity, you're in the state of realizing, understanding, being enlightened, and you're in the state of realizing, I am an heir of Father. Now, let your counsel come. And listen, I'm convinced that in order for kingdom to invade earth, which they're already one objectively, but for heaven to become one with earth, which they already are objectively, there has to be a people that have this change of shift through prayer to where they come to the place to where they're no longer interested in having their intellect, their logic, their reason, their senses, their emotions rule the day, but they're seeking for the kingdom council to come out of them. I'm convinced if people would seek the counsel of the kingdom, heaven and earth would subjectively become one. I am convinced that people in the White House would think differently. I am convinced we'd see a shift in the whole world. I'm convinced of that. But because religion has so bamboozled and hoodwinked us, we've put it off to heaven someday. Someday, when I die in my body and I get to heaven, 
I'm going to get to experience everything that he says I am. <laughs> if you're waiting on that, ain't never going to come. Pardon my incorrect English. If you're waiting on that, it's never going to come. Now, look what he says here in verse 10. Thy will be done in earth. Have you ever noticed how people, when they quote that, they'll say, on earth? But it's got to happen in earth here before it can happen on earth there, okay? Thy will, verse 10, be done in earth as it is in heaven. That's the English, King James. Aramaic says, let your will be even, listen, as it is throughout the universe. i read that again. Let your will be even, I'm going to add a word, as it already is. Let your will be even as it already is in heaven throughout the universe. So God's will. So many people, oh, what's God's will for my life? Well, I could tell you what God's will for your life is. I may not know what your ministry is, but I can tell you what your purpose is. It's to be an expression of him. (laughs) Plain and simple. So his will, this word will in Aramaic also is interesting. It means a desire and a wish. And when we think of the word will many times, we think of, well, something forceful. His will being forced upon us. You know, like the scripture that says, uh, every a knee will bow and every tongue will confess. No, every knee and, uh, will bow and every tongue will confess. Not forcibly, forcibly, because the Father makes them. No, willingly, effortlessly, because Spirit is working within them. So in Aramaic, this word will here means a desire and a wish. A desire and a wish. In other words, let your wish, your desire, be throughout the earth as it already is in the universe or throughout the heavens. But remember, in the beloved, the parent, the father-mother term of endearment, as we breathe that and we go into prayer with an empty disc, what is going to happen is all of these things we've talked about so far this evening are going to move from just being an objective reality and become a subjective experience and walk within our lives. And God's will will be done in this earth as it already is in this heaven, this consciousness. It will subjectively be manifested. And then it can be manifested in the earth out here. As a pe- See, that is, when, that is when and only when people, when it happens in this earth, from the consciousness our heavens and is manifested in our earth, that is the only way that we're really going to truly be able to say with any authority, I see the whole earth out here full of the glory of God. Until it happens in here, we're not going to be able to truly see it out there from our heart. We may see it because we're told to see it that way, but that's all it is. It has to become a revelation to us through the experience of our heavens releasing our higher consciousness, mind of Christ, releasing that in to our earth. Now, when we're talking about wish and desire, so many people today, and I, I read this so many times on, on Facebook, they're talking about, well, without suffering, without pain, there's no gain. You gotta suffer. You gotta suffer. In Aramaic, you will not find that. And I'm gonna teach on it. Not tonight, but I'm gonna teach on it. You'll not find suffering. You'll not find that. But so many people talk about suffering. The more you suffer, the greater lesson that you're going to learn. The more you go through, the greater anointing you're going to have. But let me ask you this question. Let's look at a a natural parent and child relationship. How many parents would tempt their child? Exactly. How many parents would take their kid's hand and put it on the hot burner and say, I'm going to teach you a lesson never to touch the hot stove. Yep. You'd put that person in a mental hospital. Yep. Mm-hmm. But yet many people today are saying that we learn 
lessons. Now, I'm not saying you can't learn some things. Don't misunderstand. But what I'm saying is our Father's will and desire is not to put on us sickness and suffering and that sort of thing to grow us up or to teach us. When we have Holy Spirit that we can listen to, there's some things I wish I would listened to my parents before I went out and did some things and paid the price for it. And we probably all have that testimony. If I'd have just listened, I wouldn't have gone to jail. <laughs> if I'd have just listened, I wouldn't have experienced what I experienced. You know, you do the crime, you pay the time, right? Many, many times. But had we listened, it would have been a different story. So, talking about his will and his purpose, his will and his purpose is the same will and purpose any parent would have for their child. Not that they learn through hardship or hard things. Can they learn? Yes. But the Father doesn't bring it on them. Our Heavenly Father doesn't bring it on them either. Now, in verse 11, let me read the English first. Give us this day our daily bread. Now listen to the Aramaic. I love it. Present tense. The Aramaic says, you provide us with our needful bread from day to day. You provide us, not give us, Father, please give us this day our daily bread. No, Aramaic, you provide us with our needful bread from day to day. And notice in Aramaic, you provide and continually, there you have both tenses. What do you have? You have in Aramaic the two verb tenses, the one being perfect right now. See, and I could talk about invisible supply. Right now, if you have any apparent lack in your life, know this, you already have it as a, in seed form in the invisible realm within you right now. You already have it. And as you focus, where focus goes, energy flows, and as you focus on that in your conscious awareness, then it will be projected out because that's what our heart awareness is. It's a projector that projects it out. So when you hold it in your conscious awareness, it'll eventually be projected out. So what he says here in the Aramaic, you provide us with our need for bread from day to day, that's because we are not disconnected in thinking that we need to ask him for it. We know we already have it in the form of invisible supply. See, I believe until we can realize that in the invisible part of our being we have all things already, until we can realize that, and until we can realize that that holds even more power and anointing and authority than even when it's manifested. I know you don't like that, but it's the truth anyhow. Listen, everything that we see came out of spirit. Yes. Everything that we see came out of spirit. So where is the greatest power? <laughs> it's in that which produced it. It's in that which brought it forth into manifestation. So you provide us, Aramaic, with our need for bread from day to day, simply because our focus is on the fact that we already have it. It's not something we have to ask him, as the English says, give us this day. Or daily bread. Now, when you're talking about daily bread, the fact that it uses the word needful bread, it's not just talking about bread or food. It's talking in the Aramaic about everything that you have an apparent need of. Yes. As that focus becomes enlarged within our feminine principle, our virgin consciousness, our soul, our heart awareness, it will be manifested outwardly. Now, verse 12. I'm going to get into some really good parts here. And I'm going to close. Verse 12 says, and this is the King James. It says, and forgive us our debts. Let me slow down a little bit here because this is so important. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's what the English says. Aramaic says, forgive our offenses as we have forgiven our offenders. Now, in the Aramaic, forgive means it's shawach. Got to get the throat involved. Shawach. It means to untie. It means to release, and it means to untie. So someone's offended us, 
and we don't release or untie that offense, who's in the worst shape? We are. They could care less if you go to them. They may be having a jolly old time. And here you are hurt and bitter and upset and getting sick. And Corey Tin Boom said this, when I release a prisoner, I realized that the prisoner was me. Now I'm going to give you more on this, but look at verse 13. And lead us not into temptation. First of all, as we already stated, God never leads anyone into temptation as James tells us. So in the Aramaic, listen to this, it's not lead us not into temptation as though God leads us, so now God don't lead us. The beloved leads us, so now we're asking, don't lead us. Lead us not into temptation. The Aramaic says, and do not let us enter into temptation. We're the ones. We're the ones who yield, must yield. The lower desires, the intellect, the reason, the logic, the senses, the emotions. And if we don't, what happens is we lead ourselves into temptation. So... Again, do not let us enter into temptation, but deliver us from, and it's not evil, it's error or mistakes. Did you know that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the original Hebrew is not good and evil, it is good and bad? (laughs) Evil is not even used. Now, the fifth thing we want to look at, and then we're going to go back to this forgiving thing. The rest of verse 13 says, For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever, amen. That's what the English says, but listen to the Aramaic. For thine is the counsel. Remember, kingdom means counsel. Thine is the counsel, the might, the energy, the force, strength, and song of praise. And in the Aramaic, it does not say amen at the end of this prayer which so many times we have thought, amen, when we say amen, that means so be it. That's a weak definition of the Aramaic. What it means is, I'm faithful, I'm firm, and I'm going to participate. That's what amen means, even though there's none here in this particular prayer. So, one of the meanings that I was building upon this message on prayer is to trap That's the meaning, one of the meanings in Aramaic of prayer, to trap, to trap. What are we trapping? We are trapping the objective reality, and we want to trap it in our heart awareness. Some people call it, again, soul, virgin consciousness, feminine principle. It's all one and the same. We want to trap the truth that we already have all things in the invisible realm. And if we can trap that, that's prayer. If we can trap that, it will move us into a shift of energy to where we delight, to where we are enlightened, to where we receive manifestly, to where we experience subjectively everything that we already are. That's what we want to trap in prayer. It's not going to God, Father, will you give me this, give me that, give me the other. No. It is trapping the fact that you already have it in seed form, objectively, in the invisible realm. I'm trying to say it every way I can say it. In the soul realm. In the heart awareness, which is a projector that then projects it out into subjective manifestation. Now, let me go back and read these, beginning with verse 9, in the King James, and then also, or in the English, and then in the Aramaic, and let me comment on each one, okay? So it begins there, this prayer begins, our Father, meaning beloved, and it's a term of endearment, And it connects us in our oneness with the beloved. And we see that he's approachable. All of that goes into our beloved. Then it goes on, who art in heaven, or Aramaic says, who art everywhere. 
In other words, all good surrounds Father. Every good and perfect gift, James says, is from above, but from the Father of lights, with whom there's no doubt about this, that all good, not suffering, not evil, not bad, he is the Father of lights, of whom all good comes from. And that constitutes who art in heaven or who is everywhere. In other words, all good surrounds us. Hallowed be thy name, or holy be your name, sanctified, sacred, set apart for this purpose. And so are we set apart and sanctified for the purpose of expressing and moving from objective reality to subjective experience. And remember the Aramaic, it's all in the present. Verse 10, thy kingdom come, is the English, or let your counsel come. And you see, as we've come into the shift of our delight, our enlightenment, our understanding, our airship, then the counsel can come and it can be added or unfolded out of us. The counsel is there. The counsel of the Father, the counsel from within. Thy kingdom come. Thy counsel come from within. Not out here, but from within. Verse 10, thy will be done, or the Aramaic, let your will, desire, and wish be done. And his desire and wish for every one of us and everyone on the face of this earth, even if they aren't aware of it, is for good. Intrinsic good. Not just the good on the tree of good and bad, but intrinsic good. Verse 10, in earth, here, and that earth too, as it is in heaven, or the Aramaic says, even as in the heavens or universe, also let it be, as it is in the heavens already, let it be the same way on the earth. And again, it is objectively. But we want to move it from the objective to the subjective manifestation. Verse 11, give us this day our daily bread, or you provide, the Aramaic says, you provide bread for our needs from day to day. And again, this is not food alone. This is any apparent need that we may have as we trap the invisible reality within our awareness, as we trap it there. As we trap it there, and it's sealed there, if you will. Okay? Now, here's what I wanted to get to. Verse 12. King James says, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Or the Aramaic says, And forgive us our offenses even as we have forgiven our offenders. Now, let me say this, and I know this is very strong language. Why would our Father, and you've heard me say this before, why would our Father, who is love, be offended yeah. by anything we've ever done? When he tells us, blessed are you when you're not offended by anything, why would we think that he is offended by something that we have done when he is love? And he is love. So there's not even any, uh, there, there's no, uh, what's the word I want? There's no possibility of him having to forgive us because he wasn't offended in the first place. Right? Now listen. When we untie someone or release someone, this is what it's talking about. When you release someone that's offended you, this is what this is really saying. In the Aramaic, where it says, forgive us our offenses. Untie us from our hurts yeah. as we untie others. Yeah, that's what it's saying. Yeah. Untie us from the bitterness that we have in our heart because someone offended us has nothing to do with God forgiving us. He's love. He has no propensity. That's the word I wanted. He has no propensity to have to forgive us in the first place because he is love and he never was offended in the first place. So what is this saying? Forgive us our offenses even as we have forgiven our offenders. What it is saying is if we will untie people and release people what they said about us or did to us, then we release our burden, we release our grudge, we release our, our hurt, we release our offenses. That's it. 
got something else to say at the end about that that's even gooder. Then it goes on to say in verse 13, lead us not into temptation or the Aramaic, let us not lead ourselves into temptation. Because Father God never does lead us. We allow ourselves to be tempted according to what James said about it. Verse 13 continues, but deliver us from evil or the Aramaic says, free us from error, mistakes. And so as we turn to him for his counsel from within, we are effortlessly and naturally freed. You'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And his counsel is his word. So when we <coughs> embrace his word, his truth, that is what makes us free. That will release us, as it says there, free us from error or mistakes that we've made. Now, verse 13 continues, For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Or, Aramaic, because yours is the kingdom. Now, let me say it this way. It really says yours is kingdom and power and glory from all ages throughout all ages. You know why it doesn't say the kingdom, the glory? Aramaic does not use definite articles. For example, when it's talking about the only begotten Son of God, the is the definite article, not there in the Aramaic. Meaning he's a begotten and beloved Son of God, just as we are. That's big, people. When it says, he, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. Aramaic doesn't have the, the definite article. Because the same life that's in Christ Jesus, the same life in him is the same life in us. So what is the way then? It's when I turn to the I amness of the one life that I am and have, which is the same life that he is and has. Hello? So, what is the way, the truth, and the life? You are. Not in and of yourself, but when you turn within to the eye. Jesus said, I never do anything but what I see my Father do. What was the Father in him? It was his Christ consciousness, the I amness of Jesus. Right. We're going to do a message on that. The humanness of Jesus. Oh, I just got in trouble there by saying that. But I'm just saying, we're going to do that. We're going to do that. He was not the only begotten son. He was a son of God on the same level that you are a son of God. And Jesus himself, the man, the son of man, as he called himself, was not the way, the life, the truth. Because way and life and truth is on the inside of you to the same degree that it was in Jesus. Now, this is merely an outline of the attitude, as I taught tonight, in the consciousness that we should be in when we pray. Now, let me back up and say something to just really reiterate the scripture on, if we don't forgive, God's not forgiving us. Do you know that Matthew, because if you jump on down in Matthew 6, Verses 14 and 15, it says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Matthew borrowed that from Mark eleven twenty six, 26, which says, But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. That was not in the scriptures. It was added by the translators. That was added by the translators. And Matthew borrowed it from Mark. It was added. And if you look in chapter 5, just a few verses above chapter 6, and verse 45, it says, The rain, the, the, the sun shines on the good and the wicked. Oh, wait. But if you don't forgive, you're not forgiven. The sun shines on the good and the wicked. And the rain falls on the just and the unjust. How could that be? If he doesn't forgive us, if we don't forgive our brother or sister their trespasses. I 
that's my case. <laughs> Father, we thank you. Yes, Lord. Thank you for your word. Yes, Lord. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for Holy Spirit that even now is quickening, conceiving these truths within our heart awareness. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you, Father, who you are in, through, and as us. We bless you tonight. We honor you. We give you praise. We give you glory. And we thank you for revealing yourself unto us in this hour. In the name of the Lord, amen.